So our final speaker tonight is Dr. Rudy Gonzalez. Um, he's speaking, I, I love New World Translation. I half-jokingly refer to it as the New World Transgression. But um, Dr. Rudy Gonzalez is going to be speaking on the New World Translation under the lens of Biblical Greek. So this should be interesting. All right. Well, it's been an amazing uh, day today. I've got to say that I don't uh, uh, get a lot of opportunities to attend meetings like this where we focus on uh, people who have come out of cults and, you know, uh, those unorthodox uh, religions. And so whenever I have the opportunity to be able to, uh, to, to attend and to take part, it truly is a blessing for me. And I, I've got to tell you, I hope that what I bring today uh, brings some light and hopefully uh, helps you uh, handle the question with respect to the New World Translation a little bit better uh, after I finish with this. But I, I've just got to be honest. I think that I've learned more than anything that I might share with you today. And so for all the presenters that I've had the opportunity to hear up until this point, I just want to thank the Lord for each and every one of them because they have been amazing speakers, and I'm thankful to the Lord for that, right? Amen. My name is uh, Rudy Gonzalez. Actually, it's Rodolfo Gonzalez Davila. That's my name, but you can call me Brother Rudy. I was born in Chicago, so I guess that makes me a Yankee. Uh, but I was uh, raised in Monterrey, Nuevo Leon, in, uh, in Mexico, so uh, I guess that makes me not a Yankee. Uh, <laughs> currently, I live in, uh, I live in uh, Texas uh, and uh, in the city of San Antonio. Anybody here ever been to San Antonio? Beautiful city, right? I've lived in many places. Uh, God has taken me to a lot of uh, places to, to teach. I've taught in Atlanta. Uh, I taught uh, in Mill Valley, Golden Gate Seminary, uh, overlooking the, the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, there for a number of years, I was in California doing that. Uh, God has taken me to other parts of the world to teach uh, here and there. But for me, there's no place like home, and it's not Chicago, and it's not Monterrey either. For me, it's uh, San Antonio, Texas, and I'm, and I'm, uh, and I'm thankful to live there. I'm a professor of uh, New Testament. I'm probably one of two or three in the country that can teach uh, Koine Greek, Biblical Greek with a Spanish accent. So uh, if you're ever interested in wanting to learn, uh, you know, the present active indicative of Luo, Luo, Oesai, Omenete, Usi, so on and so forth with a Spanish accent, you talk to me after the service and we'll see if we can put something together. All right. Uh, my wife uh, is with me today, Virginia, back there in the back. She's my unofficial, no, actually, she's my official timer. She says, I'm going to be back there and let you know when you've got 10 minutes, let you know when you've got five minutes, so I probably won't pay attention to her. But anyway, she's going, <laughs> she's going to be doing some of that. My wife, uh, Virginia, of, uh, she'll correct me if I'm wrong, 46 years. Praise God for that. And our one and only son, Rudy. Uh, who with us and travels with us uh, whenever we have the opportunity uh, to do as we've had today. Um, I do have a little bit of a Jehovah's Witness connection, and I need to be, uh, I just need to, to share a word about that, because uh, when, when I was born in Chicago, but we moved immediately to Mexico, my parents uh, were, uh, uh, moved to, to Monterrey, to Monterrey, Mexico, where I was reared in my early life. Uh, and we, were re we were reared nominally Catholic. Then when I was about 11 years old, in 19, uh, oh, about 1961, thereabouts, we moved to uh, San Antonio. And uh, my mother, my father, my family moved to San Antonio the family moved to San Antonio, and my father uh, went on to work in, uh, in Chicago. So he left my mother, who didn't speak a word of English, living in San Antonio with four boys that we didn't speak, speak much English either. Uh, and uh, my mother was, was looking for somewhere to connect 
religiously, theo, uh, you know, uh, in, in some kind of Christian sense. And as it turned out, we had uh, a family, a Jehovah's Witness family, uh, visit our home not long after we moved to San Antonio. And my mom took to it like, you know, like, like it was the real deal. And she became very involved with the uh, with the uh, with the Kingdom Hall there in the neighborhood, maybe about half a mile away from uh, from where we live. Of course, I'm 11 years old, and so wherever Mom goes, little Rudy goes too. And uh, for the next 10 years or so, uh, we attended uh, the Kingdom Hall there in San Antonio. So I attended uh, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society from from about 1962, I'd say. To about 1972 all right very familiar uh, with the with the theology the teachings of the watchtower organization I remember the books that we studied uh, back then and I fully 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 believe that Armageddon would come in 1975 at the time in 1972 I'm sorry in 1973 something uh, dramatic happened in my life. Actually, in 1972, something uh, uh, very catastrophic ha uh, happened. I I lost a very good friend of mine, which threw me into a an emotional tailspin. Uh, they presented me here as Dr. Gonzalez, and I, I do hold a PhD. But before I was a PhD, I want you to know that I was a high school dropout. I uh, I lost my my best friend. In April of 1972, he died of a brain hemorrhage, and I lost all interest in school. And I did what every uh, what every good Jehovah's Witness, uh, 18, 17, 18 year old would do. I dropped out of <laughs> I dropped out of uh, high school, and I joined the Marine Corps. And so I went into the Marine Corps, right? But in my mind, I was still thinking. As a, as a Jehovah's Witness, even though I wasn't baptized. I was thinking that somewhere along the way I'd be able to, to get it right with the organization. I'd get baptized in time for 1975, and I'd enter into, into paradise. Boy, boy, was I messed up in my, in my thinking, but that's the way I was thinking back then. <laughs> well, my friend died in 72. I joined the Marine Corps. I came back in 73 after boot camp. Boot camp in Paris Island, by the way, the land that God forgot. Uh, <laughs> Paris Island, South Carolina. Uh, came back in 1973, and I heard about a friend of mine uh, who all of a sudden had become religious. And in my mind, I thought of him kind of as a kind of a little bit of a hippie type. He wore long hair, and so I thought he'd become like a flower child or something like that. You know, back in the day. I uh, went to see him, myself and another friend. We went to go see him, really to mock him, to make fun of him, because in my mind I knew that, that whatever he had embraced was not, the, was not the truth, because I knew what the truth was, at least intellectually, and for me the truth was the teachings that I had, that I had received at, uh, at, the, at the Kingdom Hall. We get there to his house, Cincinnati Street, a very public and, and busy street there in San Antonio. We honk the horn thinking he's not, wanna, he's not gonna wanna come out. He comes out with a Bible in his hand, gets in the back seat of the car and starts preaching the gospel to us. I don't know what it was, honestly, to this day, I'm not sure that I can explain it, but he just put it to us. He really didn't give me an opportunity to, to mount the defense against his presentation of the gospel. He just offered the gospel in the simplest of terms and asked, asked us, because it was me and another guy, Ernie, asked us if we wanted to receive Christ as Lord and Savior in that evening. And I totally forgot that uh, Christ's uh, atonement was for the 144,000, you know, not the Jonah Dab class and all of that. Uh, I said, yeah, I want that. So he made us get out of our car, get on our knees out there in the middle of the street with cars coming by and everybody seeing. He says, Jesus died publicly. You've got to receive him publicly. So we got on our knees that uh, Tuesday evening, April 27, 1973, and I made an honest profession of faith in Christ. And I've got to tell you, 
that when I got back up off of my knees, I was already thinking like a Christian. I was, there were, God was already challenging ideas and beliefs that I thought were solid and true forever and ever. And from that day forward, God started transforming my mind and transforming my thinking. That evening, I went and uh, uh, bore witness to my conversion to my family who thought I had gone crazy. My mother was a devout Jehovah's Witness. She started crying. She couldn't understand what had happened to me. I shared the gospel. I shared my testimony with my next door neighbor, Lillian Blow, who was a believer. She opens the door. It's about 10:30 in the morning, 10:30 at night that same Tuesday evening. She opens the door. She looks at me and she says, "Rudy, you just got saved, didn't you?" And <laughs> I said, yes, how do you know? She says, well, I can, I can see it in you. So she was the first one, Lillian Blow, lived next door to, next door to us, who uh, affirmed that truly she was seeing something new and different in my life. That uh, weekend, I was able to lead one of my brothers uh, to faith in Christ, Angelo. I've got three brothers, Angelo, Alex, and Joe. I led Angelo to faith in Christ. And over the next uh, six months or so, I was able to to work with my mother, who then, after about six months or so, came to faith in Christ as well. Today she's 90 years old. She's still a faithful, strong believer in Jesus. And, uh, and we move forward. We move forward. So um, I, uh, I thank the Lord for my experience. I can't say that I had this, this, uh, this deep experience as a Jehovah's Witness, again, because I was never, I was never baptized as a member of the theocratic kingdom, but I did believe it, and uh, and I'm thankful that the Lord brought me to faith. Since that day, He called me to ministry. By the way, I was saved on April 27, 1973. I know that because the next day was a Wednesday, and all good Baptists go to church on Wednesdays. So I went to church the next day. The guy that led me to faith in Christ invited me to go to church because he wanted me to make my profession of faith public. So April 27th, come to faith in Christ. April 28th is my birthday. I turned 20 years old that day. I go to church on Wednesday, and that's the day I met Virginia. So I, <laughs> I met the Lord I met the Lord on a Tuesday, and the, the very next day I met Virginia. In Spanish, we have a saying, donde pongo el ojo, pongo la bala. Does anybody know what that means? Where I put my eye, that's where I put the bullet, okay? And I, <laughs> and I, <laughs> that's where I place the bullet. And I put my ojo, my eye, on Virginia, and I knew that she was going to be my sweetie. And six months later, by November of that same year, we were married. And off, uh, and the rest is history, as they say. So the Lord totally uh, revolutionized my life. And it was happening like one day to the next, one day, one day to the next. I started out as a, uh, as a dropout, and I thought I was, I was happy being a dropout. I didn't have academic aspirations or anything like that. I was a, I was a heavy equipment operator, a, a bulldozer operator in a, in a pit there in uh, San Antonio. But within a year, I felt God calling me to ministry. Uh, and I knew I needed to learn how to marry, bury, and baptize people because I had no idea how to do any of that. So I went to school to get my GED. One thing led to the next, and over over the following years, I was able to pursue a number a number of uh, of degrees. Uh, just another word before before we get into the Greek text here, because I went to a school that required that you learn elementary Greek and Hebrew for your undergraduate degree. You didn't take Spanish, you didn't take French, you didn't take German, you took Greek or he no, you took both one year of Greek and one year of Hebrew. And I remember when I started taking uh, Greek, again, I'm young, 21, 22 years old thereabouts. When I start taking Greek, this is in like in 1975, 1976, those years, uh, they start telling me about the, about the verb. 
and how the subject is implied in the Greek verb. Luo is I lose or I destroy. Lue is you lose or you destroy. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Lue is he, she, or it loses or destroys. The verb, the, the, the subject is implied in the verb. And that, to me, came like, like it was just the most normal thing in the world because that's true in Spanish as well. In Spanish, corro is I corro. I can't say you corro. I would have to say tú corres. Yo corro, él corre, ella corre. So depending on who the subject is, the verb changes. The, the, way that the, the way that the verb is spelled out changes. And so right then and there I discovered, man, I can use my Spanish to help me learn my Greek. This doesn't happen in English, by the way. If I just say loose, you don't know who loose. I loose, you loose, we loose, they loose, who loose? You have to come up, you have to express the subject, right, uh, of that particular uh, verb form. But in Spanish, I found an association between uh, the Spanish that I knew and the Greek that I was trying to learn. And by the way, that's true in Hebrew as well. All of that to say that I think, I think it helped me. It helped me and it gave me a desire to want to uh, learn the biblical languages. And uh, I just thank the Lord because... When I did my undergraduate work, all my electives were in the biblical languages. I went to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary where I earned a Master's of Divinity in biblical languages. All my electives were either in Greek or in Hebrew. Then I went on to Princeton Seminary where I did a THM, and I also focused on Hebrew over there. Then I went and did my, my doctoral work at Baylor University in New Testament, so everything was uh, was in was in Greek, and uh, I guess it was around 19 uh, Virginia, around 1990 or thereabouts that I began uh, that I began teaching, and since then, let me see, what are we looking at? 90, 26 years, 20, 27, 29 years or so, something like that, that I've been uh, that I've been teaching uh, a biblical language, and uh, I don't think I've learned it all. You could probably ask me a question here today with respect to Koine, which is the term for Biblical Greek, that I could probably not answer. Okay, so I don't want to come across here as a as a Biblical as a as a language or a grammarian know-it-all, because I still continue to I still continue to learn. But what I want to do today is just for a few moments. Uh, my wife was looking at my. Uh, at my presentation here, and, and, and she was telling me, and rightly so, Rudy, you're going to get into the, wi into the weeds real, real quick, and, and, uh, and I'm afraid you're going to lose some people along the way. Uh, I don't think so. I think all of us here uh, will be able to understand the points uh, that I want to make here. By the way, can you see something back there? Can you? Uh, there's a few points that I make along the way that I probably won't mention, but I'm going to hit the highlight with respect to every, with respect to every uh, text that we're going to look at. Okay? And uh, I've been debating whether I want to let you ask questions. I'm afraid to let you ask questions because if I like the question, I'll answer it. But if I don't like the question, voy a empezar a hablar en español. Okay? <laughs> I'll start talking in Spanish instead. But... Um, We'll see, we'll see, we'll see how it goes, all right? So, the title of my, uh, of my presentation today is The New World Translation Under the Lens of Biblical Greek, all right? If we go to the next, uh, if we go to the next page, you'll notice that what I've given you there is just uh, a few details and facts and, and uh, information with respect to the New World uh, Translation, I find it interesting, and I've used it apologetically, uh, and even in my witnessing with the Jehovah's Witnesses, who insist on wanting to use the New World Translations, I ask them to turn to the copyright page of the 
of the New World Translation, and they will notice that the whole Bible, the copyright for the whole Bible was 1961. Okay? So I asked them, well, what did you use prior to 1961? Well, I wasn't a Jehovah's Witness prior to 1961. But if you know your JW history, you know that prior to these years, the Jehovah's Witnesses used the King James Bible uh, in English. Now, my mother was a Testiga de Jehová in Spanish. So in Spanish, they used the Reina y Valera. And they continued using it even some years after the New World Translation came out in 1961. So I, I ask them, I say, hey, listen, if it was, uh, if the if the King James was good for for Jehovah's Witnesses, including Nathan H. Knorr prior to 1960, why isn't it good for us today? Can we just put the, can we just set the New World Translation aside and let's focus on a text or a Bible that both of us would agree was used by the organization at some point in time? And uh, if they're willing to do that, then I have them put the New World Translation aside and we deal with the King James. If they're not willing to do that, then fine, we'll continue with the, with the New World Translation and we'll see where, where the Lord uh, takes us. But anyway, uh, here's some information. You may know a lot of this information. Uh, it was available completely as a Bible in 1961. Revised, however, in 1970, 81, 84, and most recently in uh, 2013. According to the Watchtower organization, they have printed over 220 million copies of, uh, of the New World Translation. That's as of 2018, so I'm sure the number uh, has continued uh, to grow. It's been translated in whole or in part in 180 uh, languages. And uh, another point that I think is important is to note that uh, the New World Translation was translated from the Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic uh, uh, texts that they used into English. But the other versions of the New World Translation, La Traducción del Nuevo Mundo, for example, which is the equivalent of the New World Translation in English, it's the, the New World Translation in Spanish, that translation was not made from the original language. All other New World translations into other languages are based on the English New World translation. So the Greek and the Hebrew is really once removed. It isn't a direct translation. They aren't direct translations, rather, uh, from the original languages. All right. Uh, oh, by the way, I've given you the website there, which is... Uh, the Jehovah's Witness website where you can read the latest 2013 version concerning the New World uh, Bible translation if we go to the if we go to the next one my dear brother thank you uh, <clears throat> we're all familiar with this and I won't spe spend much time with it uh, the watchtower uh, made the point that they that they didn't want to advertise the translators you know uh, of the translation, but to let the glory go to the author of the scriptures, God. However, uh, we've discovered since those days who the translators were. I've mentioned them here. Nathan H. North, Frederick Franz, uh, Albert Schroeder, George Genghis, and Milton uh, Henschel, among others, I imagine. Uh, and what's important for us to know is, as one of my brothers mentioned here just a few minutes ago, is that none of these uh, gentlemen here uh, had any actual training in uh, the biblical languages. Uh, given that, what they did is, is interesting because they were able to produce a translation. But you have to wonder what kind of sources, what kind of uh, tools they turned to to be able to translate uh, this, uh, this Bible uh, at at that time in history. Today there are so many tools available even for the layman that I bet any one of us here could uh, could translate the Bible from the Hebrew and the Greek if we just bought the, the kind of uh, literary tools that are available for us uh, today. Incidentally, uh, I meant to mention this, uh, in 20, around 20, 
2009, I was invited to be a member of a translating committee. We all know that the King James Bible was translated in 1611, right? Well, the 400-year anniversary of the King James was in 2011. So there was a committee that was formed to, to translate, to make a, to render a new translation using the same manuscripts that were used by the King James translators back in 1611. And I was invited to be a, a member of that committee. We, we used those same manuscripts. All that the King James uh, writers used, we limited ourselves to that, and we made a new and fresh translation of, uh, of the Bible, not just the New Testament, but the Old and New Testament. It's called the Modern English Version. If, uh, if you ever want to uh, own a Bible where you, uh, where you know someone who was actually involved in the translation of that Bible, and I encourage you to buy the modern English version and to come and shake my hand. And you can say that, yes, I know someone who, who worked on that translation. I, I translated the book of uh, Philippians, and I also translated the book of uh, Philemon in, uh, in that particular translation. In 2011, we presented that translation to the Queen of England. Uh, the members of the committee of the, of the translating team went to England, and it was officially presented to her in the 400-year anniversary of the King James. And we did that at Westminster Chapel in uh, 2011. Uh, anyway, uh, here we go. Let's uh, go on to look at the next slide. Assessing the New World Translation of the Bible. Some uh, biblical scholars see it as a, as a reliable, literal translation. But I would argue that most evangelical uh, scholars who have taken a look at the New World Translation aren't quite, as, uh, aren't quite as positive about this translation. I'm quoting Dr. Anthony Hokima here who notes that the New World Translation is by no means an objective rendering of the sacred text in the modern English but is a biased, biased translation in which many of the peculiar teachings of the, new, of the New World Translation, of the Watchtower, I'm sorry, are smuggled into the text of the Bible itself. I would agree with that assessment. And so what we're going to do here as we move forward is we're going to ask the question and try to answer it. How does the New World uh, Bible Translating Committee actually smuggle Watchtower doctrines into the text of the of the New World Translation. So let's see that. I propose to you that the way it happens is in one of three ways. They do it first by adding words that are not that are not justified by the original text of the Bible. The first, uh, the first method or the first uh, tactic that they employ is that they add words that are not justified by the original text of the Bible. Look at the, the next uh, frame here. All of us are very familiar with this. I could spend two hours talking about the 237 insertions of the, of the, tetra, of the name Jehovah into the, into the New Testament. And all of us know that there is actually no textual support for that. Now, this is what I want us to understand. That the Watchtower Society truly believes that sometime during the second century, look at what I have highlighted there in red, that sometimes during the second century or early third century, uh, a practice developed where those copying the manuscripts replaced the, tet the tet tetragrammaton with a title such as Lord or God or copied manuscripts where this had already been done. This is a direct quote from Jehovah's Witness uh, literature. They truly believe that the autographs, the original writers used the name of Yahweh, but uh, later copyists then made these changes. Well, does that hold water? And I turn you to the next one. And I just simply want you to see 
uh, we don't have time to get into, into the details of all of that, but I would encourage you to read this documentary called Fragments of Truth. It's a, it's a documentary uh, which highlights the work of Craig Evans, uh, who has done extensive work in this area. And notice what Evans has uh, uh, proposes in this documentary. He shows that the New Testament autographs existed until the 4th century when the New Testament was canonized. This is important because up to this point, many scholars believe that the originals, the autographs, were lost early so that all people had to work with were copies. But Evans proposes, and I think he does it in a very convincing way, that the actual autographs continued to exist, not just for 50 years, but for 100 years, for 200 years, for as many as even up to 300 years, so that the church always had access to the originals. Now, there's a tremendous implication if this is true, because if the, tr if the originals existed for the span of one, two, and even 300 years, then all these supposed copies that changed the name uh, of, of God's name to either Kurios or Theos, it would be easy. It would, somebody would have noticed it and would have raised an objection. The fact that, uh, the, fact that the originals uh, existed for as long as they did uh, argue strongly against this idea that uh, some copyist in the, in the late second century began making these changes that the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, suggest. Another point that he makes, I think pretty convincingly, is that the New, manus the New Testament copies or manuscripts were likely copied by non-Christian scribes with no theological agenda. You've got to remember that literacy wasn't as widespread as it is today. So that the church, rather than rely on people with dubious literary credentials, they would have hired professional copyists to make the copies of these translations. And you cannot argue that these people uh, who were professional in their work would have just arbitrarily removed the name of God in these translations. Now, when we look at the work that Evans has done, I think it leaves us with a powerful, with a with a with a with a powerful trust and confidence in knowing that uh, the New Testament that was ultimately canonized in the in the fourth century, in the early fourth century, was essentially uh, the the. The, the original, the manuscript that was written originally by the apostles in the, first, uh, in the first century. The point is this, there never was a time when copies of New Testament books were produced when they couldn't be compared to their originals up to the moment of canonization. So in my estimation, this documentary, Fragments of Truth, debunks totally and completely this idea by the Jehovah's Witnesses that, uh, that somehow the church began making altera alterations and changes to the name early in the second century. Does that make sense? Let's move on to another one. Uh, there's no textual support for the word other in Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 17. We're all familiar with this text. In the, 20, in the 2013 uh, edition of the New World Translation, they put the word other uh, not in brackets so that it looks like it's actually part of the text. Well, this is the point. The word other is not in the original, right? Well, let me give you, let me give you a little freebie. I'm not going to charge you anything extra for it, all right? Check this out. You're reading the New World Translation. You get to this point and you notice verse 16, for example, because by means of him all other things were created in the heavens, so on and so forth. And you discover that there's three more others in that text. There's another one in verse 20. Philippians 2.9 also has the word other, right? Assume or employ, for example, Proverbs 26.4 and 5, where you follow 
the fool according to his reasoning? And, uh, and just ask the Jehovah's Witness. I notice that your text says, by means of him all other things were created. I would simply ask the question, what kind of other things are we talking about? The reason I would ask this question is for one of two reasons. You see, in English, all we have is one word for other. It's the word other. In Spanish, it's the same way, otro. Or, or no, actually we have two, a masculine and a fem, feminine form, but it's the same thing, other. But in Greek, you have two words for other. You have alos, from which we get the word alloy, and you get heteros, from which we get the word uh, heterosexual, for example. Alos is other of the same kind, and heteros is other of a different kind. So I would ask my Jehovah's Witness friend, could you please tell me what kind of other things Jesus created? Well, they're going to go to their inner linear. They're going to go to their inner linear and they're going to discover that the word other isn't in the text. And they'll say, no, but you know, you said it was. So I want you to tell me what kind of other things Jesus created. Because if he says or she says, well, it's heteros. It's, oh, you're telling me that Jesus created all other things of a different order. If Jesus created all other things of a different kind, then what you're actually saying is that Jesus is effectively the real creator and not Jehovah. So what if you say other of the same kind, alos? That's other as well. Yeah, now, if you don't believe me, go online and you'll, you can see it, all right? If you say it's alos, other of the same kind, oh, it's others of the same kind. Well, if Jesus then create all other things of the same kind as him, then Jesus is the creator of creatures like himself, which makes the creation kind of pantheistic since they believe that he is a god. If they believe that he is a God and he created all other things like himself, then he is, in essence, imparting some kind of quasi-divinity to the created order because everything he created is like himself. It doesn't fly. Alos doesn't fly. Heteros doesn't fly. Whether it's Alos or Heteros, it creates a theological conundrum for Jehovah's Witnesses is the point. You know what they're going to do when they discover this? They're going to discover that they don't want to put the word other in this text. Because there isn't, there isn't any way to justify theologically the word. All right? Well, uh, there's a lot more that I could say about that, but... One of my nicknames is Speedy Gonzalez, so we'll move on. Uh, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, look at the next one, Acts twenty twenty eight. The New World uh, Translation inserts his own son, abs with no textual support whatsoever. I've given you the the Greek uh, text there, but uh, after the ellipsis there, you see poi myain ecclesion. All of that simply means the shepherd, the congregation of God which he purchased, and in the New World Translation, they put, which he purchased with the blood of his own son. Can I just tell you this? Son is not in the text. The red that I have there is dia tu haimatas tu idiu. There's no huias there. Son would be huias, and there's no son in the original text. Some have suggested that the original was the church of the Lord, right? But that phrase isn't found anywhere in the New Testament. I can tell you this. If the, if the theocratic, uh, if the Watchtower Society uh, had been able reasonably to put Ecclesia Curio, which is the church of the Lord in the text, they would have done it in a heartbeat. Thus, it would read the shepherd, the congregation of the Lord, which he purchased with his own blood. But of course, that text uh, also is not, uh, is not anywhere in the New Testament. There is one possibility. There is one possibility. 
Luke may have intended to mean with the blood of his own. That text, which he purchased with the blood of his own. Implied what? Implied his own son. If that's what Luke meant, I would have no problem with it because it's completely biblical, theological, and orthodox. The problem is that there is only one instance of this kind of idiom, the of his own, for example, uh, and it's only used in a plural sense in 1 Timothy 5.8. There, is, there are no uses of this kind of idiom anywhere in Luke or in Acts. So that the fact that the church of God which he purchased with his own blood is found in the most worthy manu trustworthy manuscripts. And we ought to leave well enough alone. Uh, it doesn't say that he purchased it with the blood of his own son, but that he purchased it with his own son, with his own blood let's uh let's go on to the next one uh by the way i'm just giving you a couple of examples for all of these the second way that uh that the new world translation uh plays fast and loose with the with the bible is that it violates the grammar of key texts so let's just look at a couple of illustrations here the new testament the new world translation violates the granville sharp rule I've given you the sharp, uh, the Granville Sharp rule there, about the third or fourth uh, dot down. In an article substantive, chi substantive uh, construction, uh, which is what we have there, you see the, the text that I have underlined up on top? The tain is the article. Machiron alpida is a substantive. Then you have the chi, uh, which is a conjunction. And then you have epiphaina which is another substantive. Okay, so you have a so you have a TSKS construction. The article before the first substantive always relates to the second post chi substantive. That's the point. So notice for example uh, the translation that I have down here at the bottom, the New American Standard. Looking for the blessed hope, uh, looking for Tain Makarian Elpida, looking for the blessed hope and manifestation and appearing the blessed hope and you could add the there and the manifestation because the tain there the article is actually doing double duty it's uh it's it's applying uh, the definite uh, uh, syntax for both this and what follows after the chi so uh it's a perfectly good translation looking for the blessed hope and the appearing, for example. You notice the New American Standard. What does the New World Translation do? They add an of, of. Why do they add that of? Let's read it. While we wait for the happy hope and glorious manifestation of the great God and of our Savior Jesus Christ. By inserting that word of that you see that you see there, they try to make a break between the great God and the Savior. But since this is a TSKS construction, the of great God uh, uh, does double duty with Savior. So it's the great God and the Savior, Jesus Christ, or our Savior in this, in this uh, sense. Let's move on to the next one quickly. Caldwell's rule for PNS constructions, John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, I've given just the third element there, kai theos hein ha logos, and the word was a god. Caldwell's rule basically says this. Definite predicate nouns which precede the verb usually lack the article. So this is not an unusual construction to have theos without an article there. Okay? It happens a lot. Uh, in uh, in the New Testament. When this happens, these constructions are normally qualitative and sometimes definite, rarely indefinite. In all cases, it is the context which is the determinant factor as to how we're going to translate this. So what is the context for John 1.1? 1, 1? 
I give you two things right there. Culturally, the man who wrote this text was monotheistic to the core. Would you agree with me? So does, he make, does it make any sense that John would have even implied that there was someone other than God himself who, who enjoyed some kind of lesser divinity? It makes no sense culturally speaking. But analogy of faith, in my, in my estimation, seals the deal. Look at 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6. We know. We know this. We don't just know it intellectually. We know it as believers. What? That there is no God but one, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. There is no God for one. And notice what he goes on to say. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, notice in heaven. Who would be in heaven at the time of John 1.1? 1, 1? It would be Logos. If he is merely a God, then Paul is addressing that very situation. Even if there was in heaven or on earth a God, as indeed there are many gods, verse 6, yet for us there is but one God. So the idea that the text would allow for this idea that the Logos was a God is total nonsense. Now, you may disagree with me, and uh, if you do, please be gentle with me, okay? Uh, my translation of this text is, the word was divine rather than the word was God. But when I say the word was divine, I mean divine in the full biblical sense of the word. I don't mean divine in the way that often we use divine today, for example, to, to talk about chocolate cake or anything like that. I mean divine in the full theological, biblical sense. In the sense that in the Logos dwells the full complement of divinity. Now, some people are uncomfortable with divine and will translate it as God, and I understand why. Uh, because divine seems to suggest... Uh, culturally in our day, that Jesus is somehow less than God. But if you understand what the Bible means by true divinity, you wouldn't, you wouldn't arrive at that, at that understanding. Does that make sense? So I'm okay with the word was divine, and I'm okay also with the, the word was, uh, was God. Notice, Caldwell's rule says uh, uh, these... Uh, these uh, PN uh, uh, predicate nominative constructions are normally qualitative, which is what divine is. Sometimes definite, which is what God would be. Okay, uh, but let's look at one other. Let's look at one other thing. I'm going to pass John 10:33 through 36, and I'm going to go on to. We're still with uh, John 1:1. The New World Translation overlooks its own progressive rule. I'm quoting the, the Jehovah's uh, Witness organization there in the third bullet. The New World Translation attempts to indicate progressive rather than completed actions, such as proceeded to rest instead of rested. Genesis 2.2. 2. The 2013 New World Translation indicates progressive verbs were considered contextually important. They blew it 100% with John 1.1. 1, 1. Why? En arche hein ha logos, kai ha logos, hein proston theon, kai theos, hein ha logos. In the beginning, you see the word uh, highlighted in red there? Hein. That's, the, that's a form of a me. It's a, it's a verb. It's an imperfect verb. It's not an aorist. It's not a present. It's not a future. It's not a perfect it's a it's a an imperfect verb in the beginning was the word and the word was another imperfect with god and the word was god right another imperfect when you study greek you discover that verbs have aspect the present has a continuous aspect for example i run is actually I am running. That is the aspect of the present active indicative verb in Greek. 
the past tense form of the present active indicative is the imperfect. I was running. That's why we have in the beginning was the word. What you need to understand is that all three of these verbs, which is the same identical verb, are imperfects. And the syntax, the aspect and the syntax of the imperfect verb is past continuous action. So you could translate this. If you did an amplified translation of this text, it would read something like this. In the beginning, the word was continuously with... Uh, uh, in, in the beginning, the, 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 the verb continuously was. And the word continuously was with God. And the word continuously was God. That's the aspect of the, of, the, of the imperfect verb. So what does this do? The, again, the aspect of the imperfect verb eliminates the idea of a beginning. Jehovah's Witnesses teach that, Jesus, that, the, that the Logos had a beginning, right? He's the first creation of Jehovah. But this imperfect verb eliminates that possibility altogether. All right? So, the, per, the verbs in John 1.1 1, 1 imply that the Logos was eternal. In other, in, other, in other words, there never was a time when God existed that the Logos didn't exist because He continuously was with God. Amen? And He continuously was God. So, you need to go learn Greek. And I'm the guy to teach it to you. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, oh, there's a lot. There's a lot more. Uh, I know I'm running. I'm running out of time. You know, I like to keep people hanging so that they'll invite me next year to continue. No, I'm. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm gonna. I'm gonna move past the next one, and let's go to this. Uh, the next one, the New World uh, Translation changes comma placement without textual support. Where again, we're familiar with this uh, passage. The New World Translation reads, and he said to him. Truly, truly, I tell you today, comma, you will be with me in paradise, right? Why do they put the comma where they put it? If you look at the Greek, if you look at the Greek above, it says, uh, truly, I say, uh, uh, he said to him, truly, I say to you, comma, right? Today, uh, you will be with me in, uh, in paradise. Well, what does, uh, I, I say to you today, comma, you will be with me in paradise. What is the issue? The New World Translation alters the placement of the comma to change the timing of the fulfillment of Jesus' promise to the thief at Calvary from today to a future date when Jehovah will reinstate paradise on earth, right? However, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse, verse 4 suggests that paradise was already a present heavenly reality at the time that the text was written. So we don't have to wait for some future date when God will establish uh, a, a, a restored earthly paradise. There's already a heavenly paradise installed in the, in the heavenly. So the, they need to leave the comma where it was. It isn't today, I'm telling you today that you will be with me in paradise in some time in the future. It's rather, I tell you, comma, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Okay? All right. Uh, let's move on to uh, uh, the next one. New World alters sentence structure without textual support. John 1, 3, and 4. You have the Greek text there. What I want you to see, the only thing I want you to see, I can't get into too much detail here, but what I want you to see is that the letters in red, you see ha, uh, gegon in there, and then there's a period there. That's, uh, that period is the end of that sentence. Ha, gegonen is a relative clause. Now, the New World Translation renders this text in this way. All things came into existence through him and apart from him. Not even one thing came into existence. By the way, that argues against their, uh, 
their beliefs right there. But notice, they put the period right there. Not even one thing came into existence, period. They take that relative clause and make it part of the next sentence. What has come into existence by means of him was life, and the life was the light of men. That is not what this text says. This text does not say that what came into existence by means of him was life. What this text says is that apart from him, not even one thing came into existence which had come into existence. Does that make sense? All right, so uh, the, the New World Translation takes the relative clause hagegonen as the beginning of a new sentence in verse 4 to limit Jesus' creative, creative activity to life. The proper translation is what you have down there at the bottom. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being, period. Then, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. That is the proper way to translate that passage. Well, there are a number of other things. Let's go on to number three quickly. Yeah, thank you, sir. The third way that the, that the Watchtower Society alters the Bible is that they alter word meanings in key texts. And uh, I don't want to spend too much time. You're all familiar with Stauros. They translate Stauros as torture stake rather than cross. They argue that Constantine introduced the, the pagan idea of a cross in the 4th century to woo pagans into apostate Christianity. However, you'll notice on the third bullet underneath, however, that Justin Martyr, Tertullian, Irenaeus of Lyon, and other anti-Nicene church fathers acknowledged or used the cross long before Constantine. So the idea of the cross is already in the, uh, the anti-Nicene literature. That's literature written by the church fathers before the Council of Nicaea which happened in 325. Okay? Apart from that, early Russellites prior to Rutherford's presidency also acknowledged the cross. John 20:25 20, talks about multiple nails, which would not make sense if Jesus had been uh, 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 hammered uh, or nailed, rather, to, uh, to a stake. Matthew 27, 37 talks about the Romans placing the sign above Jesus' head which would also not, not make sense if Jesus had been nailed to a stake. The, the sign would have been placed above his hands rather than above his head. Does that make sense? So there's a lot of things. I would invite you or encourage you to go find that website right there. It really is a pretty lengthy and I think an excellent article that discusses that, discusses that whole thing. Let's go on to the next one quickly. Uh, John 17, 3. This means everlasting life. They're taking in knowledge of you, the only true God and of the one whom you sent forth, Jesus Christ, right? Uh, they changed it for the 2013 translation. The 2013 translation reads, this means everlasting life. They're coming to know you, which sounds like it's more more akin with what the actual reading should be. But they put a little footnote there, and if you go to the footnote, it says, or they're taking a knowledge of you. All right? So why, why they're taking a knowledge of you? It's obvious that the term taking in knowledge is used to deny that salvation is dependent on a personal relationship with Christ. Rather, it's dependent on you being a faithful recipient of, uh, of the knowledge that the Watchtower Bio and Tract Society uh, offers uh, to its, uh, to its uh, followers. It makes you dependent on their literature and their teaching rather than on a personal relationship with Christ. In Romans 10.10, 10, they, they speak about a public declaration for salvation. Why? Because they, because they, they really emphasize this idea of uh, field service requiring members to engage in house-to-house -house public preaching as a way to gain entrance to a restored future paradise. Uh, the next one, 
The New World alternates uh, uh, translation selectively. Revelation 7.11, talking about God being worshipped. The word is proskunesan. You see that right next to that? Proskunesan to Theo. Matthew 14.33 uses the word proskunesan, the same word that is used in Revelation 7.11. But in Matthew 14.33 they, tra they translate it as obeisance rather than worship. The same thing in Luke 24, 52 and uh, in many other places as well. As is clearly evident, proskuneo is correctly translated as worship when referring to God, but mistranslated as obeisance when referring to Jesus. All right? Uh, the next one, quickly, Colossians 2.9. Uh, because it is in him that all the fullness of the divine quality dwells bodily. That it is is not in the original text. Uh, rather, it should read for in him, not it is in him. For in him, we should get rid of that word that also. That that is not there. Uh, because it is... Because in him all the fullness of what? Of the divine quality? No. Of deity. The word uh, the, uh, theotes is a noun which basically either means deity or Godhead. So the correct translation would be, For in him all the fullness of deity or of the Godhead dwells in bodily form. Um. Uh, the last one, I believe it is. John 8, 58. Jesus said to them, Most truly I say to you, before Abraham came into existence, I have been. That's the New World Translation. If, it, if, the true, if the accurate translation is, I have been, then that means that that verb is a perfect. And the aspect or the syntax of a perfect verb speaks of something that happened in the past with continuous abiding results. That's the aspect of the perfect. For example, if, I, if you ask me, are you hungry? And I say, no, I have eaten. I'm using a perfect, implying the following. I already ate, and I'm filled, and I'm, and I'm hungry. And I'm not hungry. I don't need to eat because I already ate. The perfect, the aspect of the perfect is is a past act, but the results of which continue through today. Now that verb is used perfectly in many instances in the Greek New Testament, but it is a horrible translation when you're using it to talk about who Jesus is or who God is. Because what you're saying is that God somehow happened in the past and only the effects of him continue through today. That he was back then, but his influence continues with us today. That would be the aspect of the perfect applied to ego a me. If it was a perfect, which it isn't. It is a present. And so the real translation must be, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Again, the present is also communicates this present continuous action that's the that's the that's the aspect of the of the present active indicative verb present continuous action when jesus or when god says in exodus i am he's saying i continually am when jesus says i am here in uh, in john 8:58 he is saying, he's using the present active indicative form of the verb, which is, I continually am. I always am. So there's no past, present, or future for Jesus because he always is. That's the meaning of that verb. They violate this text terribly by changing that verb from a present to a, to a perfect. All right? And then we go to the last uh, segment, I believe. The end of this wicked system of things. <laughs> All right. Uh, listen, folks. 
I went through it rather quickly. I know it's late and you've been here all day long. And I could have taken a lot of more time to to get into, into the details of all of these uh, passages. But I wanted to show you more than anything else that... Uh, that the Greek, uh, when you, that the Greek is, is a very precise language, because it's built on case endings. It's ver. It's it's built on. Uh, it's built. It's built on uh, on case and verb endings. Uh, and 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 these give a kind of specificity that is very ambiguous in the English language. Okay. Uh, when you come to understand how Greek functions, it really helps you to, not that there aren't questions, remaining questions out there, there are, but uh, nevertheless, the language itself, there are just some things that the language won't allow. And unfortunately, what the New World, Trans New World Translators have done is that they have violated in many ways uh, uh, the grammar and the syntax of uh, the Koine Greek, which is the Greek of the first century, which was used uh, by the apostles. Um, I know it's late. I want to thank you for your attention. La, you've got that there, right? You've got a copy of that. Take it home. Uh, use it to light your fireplace if you want to. Or keep it and study it. Let me, let me tell you this. If there's anything there that you that you didn't get or that you have questions about, feel free to give me a call or, or uh, send me an email. I'll be happy to answer, answer you in any way that I can. Uh, 